Hello and welcome to episode three of the Physique Development Podcast. This show is a question and answer based show where we take questions we've seen or been asked uh, by our listeners and answer them through our industry experience as coaches and from our own professional perspectives. Today, we'll be discussing three commonly asked questions or topics. Uh, number one is going to be training to failure or close to failure, which is better. That one's going to be led by myself, Coach Austin. Question number two, or topic number two, is understanding tempo, and that's going to be led by Coach Sue. Uh, number three is structuring your training while traveling. That one is going to be led by Coach Alex. What you can expect from today's episode is for each topic or question to be put on the clock for about 15 to 20 minutes. The coach leading the topic or question will start the discussion. This will lead, uh, then lead into uh, being followed up by other coaches weighing in on their thoughts and experiences. It's our goal not only to supply you, the listener, with valuable insights on topics or questions, but also to plant some seeds for further research and thought. So without further ado, let's get into topic number one, which is going to be training to failure. And with that, Austin, which is better, training to failure or training closer and closer to failure over time? So glad you asked, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as I was telling these guys before we hopped on here, I, I took a little bit different approach uh, to answering this question, and I, I hope it's really helpful. Um Basically, I want to start out by first introducing how strength training does promote muscle growth. Um, you know, what are the main drivers? What are the main factors that we're looking for uh, within our training to basically elicit or promote the muscle growth response? Uh, because I think it's helpful to know these things or at least somewhat be introduced to them uh, to give some credence or, or merit to understanding why it may not be advantageous for our long-term goals uh, to always be training to failure okay so for muscle growth for muscle hypertrophy to occur because uh, typically people are wanting you know this is the main goal uh, to some extent of you know usually when people uh, train to failure they're training sort of with the goal of growing muscle or building muscle uh, there so for muscle growth training or for muscle growth to occur there must be a mechanical stimulus or stress, okay? So this mechanical stimulus is referred to as mechanical tension or more colloquially known as sort of muscular tension, okay? Aside from muscular tension, there are two byproducts of creating tension that work against you if not properly managed. All right, so this, these two right here, metabolic stress and muscle damage, are those two byproducts of muscular tension that especially when training to failure we accumulate more and more and more of in which if you guys listen to episode two which was uh the last episode here um you would have heard me talk about kind of that fitness fatigue model and as a phase were to kind of progress on we would accumulate fatigue at a more abundant rate um, if throughout the weeks we were training to failure every week, right, that fatigue would skyrocket and we wouldn't give as much room for fitness to basically create adaptations within our fitness, which is kind of like those positive adaptations that we're getting from training. Okay, so that's kind of my intro to the discussion here. Uh, and that's kind of what you can expect me to go through uh, in the next handful of minutes here. So muscular tension. Uh, this is something that happens actively or passively through different types of muscle contractions. Okay, so you can think of concentric or eccentric or isometric sort of contractions. Uh, so when actively contracting, muscles can produce force while shortening, lengthening, staying the same length. This process is driven by the mechanoreceptors located in the muscle cells. Okay, so these mechanoreceptors are sensitive to the magnitude and the duration of loading and this basically leads to a cascade of signaling called mechanotransduction. Okay, so if you've heard that term before, that's what that means. And that leads to potential of muscle growth to occur, right? And there are a lot of other factors that I'm not necessarily gonna go into, um, but a lot of those other things have to do with nutrition, have to do with sleep, um, your overall stress management and recovery. Okay, so alongside mechanical tension, 
there are those two other sort of non-primary hypothesized drivers of muscle growth. And those are metabolic stress and muscle damage, as I mentioned. So metabolic stress is an exercise induced accumulation of metabolites, basically cellu cell waste. Okay, so a, a waste product accumulated over this process of muscle contraction. Okay, so this can lead to a release of systemic hormones, uh, inflammatory responses, and the most known thing would be the cell swelling during muscle contraction, right? That pump, uh, which is a byproduct of that tension that we create, which is going to be really important as we go into the next topic and Sue talks about uh, repetition tempo. Okay, so there are many theories working around um, metabolic stress's role in aiding in mechanical tension. Okay, so the main one that is used or understood is muscular fatigue accumulates and it helps lead to higher levels of tension being created, okay, stimulating them to grow. Okay, so it's not that we don't want any sort of metabolic stress, it's just that too much can work against us. And it's gonna help cause the next one I'm gonna go over, which is muscle damage, okay? So muscle damage occurs when intense exercise or a large amount of stress is placed on unaccustomed muscle tissue, right? This could be the fact that you've never trained before or you're training with so much volume or tension or failure or whatever, right? You've, we've all done those sessions that have left us crippled for weeks at a time. I've definitely done them. <laughs> um, and that accumulation, um, that excessive amount of damage is going to work against us. Okay, so I do say, um, or you will see that it's exercise induced muscle damage. Okay, so these muscle damage and exercise induced muscle damage, if you guys were to see them, um, again, this is part of the, the segment that creates thought and further research um, or allows you to think a bit more. Exercise induced muscle damage is just that related to exercise and induced through exercise, which you guys could make sense of that. Um, but if you guys see, like if we were to read through some research and just maybe see like muscle damage generally put, um, that can, muscle damage can also come from things like uh, inflammatory uh, myopathies, so like some sort of disease um, or a blunt trauma to a muscle tissue, which is like a car accident, right? So if you were to, you know, get bludgeoned by a, another car, which this has happened to me uh, over the in the past year, um, you will be sore and have muscle damage, but it wasn't necessarily exercise induced, okay? Um, it's thought that exercise induced muscle damage exists on a continuum, okay? Spanning from mild, which can be potentially helpful towards muscle growth, all the way to severe, which can cause large amounts of tissue disruption and negative downstream effects, which can have systemic uh, impacts long-term. The most common symptoms of exercise-induced muscle damage are going to be decreased strength and power, increased muscle stiffness, and swelling. And the most noticeable one is gonna be that delayed onset muscle soreness, right? Those DOMS. And that's, you know, those are those, that's that level of soreness we have for like, you know, it could last two days, three days, four days, five days, up to like, I've had doms for 10 plus days, um, just being an idiot and kind of training with ego or with people I shouldn't have been training with. Um, and where I'm basically getting into here is how that sort of works against us long term, right? So as we're wanting to create a large amount of mechanical tension or muscular tension, there are these byproducts that we have to manage right? And that within having to manage those, we then have to manage how often or how much, or what's the magnitude at which we're accumulating those byproducts, right? So metabolic stress and muscle damage. And that gets into training to failure, okay? So this leads us to failure-based training, okay? So I first want to define failure, right? So failure more generally sort of means until you can no longer complete a rep in the manner that was intended. 
Okay, so that's kind of a general one. Um, we can have positive failure, which is kind of that last rep before you would need assistance by a spotter, um, or form failure, which is kind of that last rep before technique gives. Um, so like concentric failure or something like that, but more form-based failure. Um, you have range of motion failure, which is a fun one, um, but know that's a little bit more advanced and that's kind of the last rep you can do with a complete range of motion. Um, kind of, it would be sort of related to form. Um, and then extended set methods, which are kind of a technique that allows you to contend beyond that initial failure point, which like drop sets, mechanical drop sets, um, all of those different things, right? We could even do tempo drop sets, which um, you guys will learn more about tempo in the next segment here. Um, but those are all sort of ways of gauging failure or, or ways to sort of label failure. I would say the most common one is going to be uh, form failure. So basically that last rep before technique gives. That's typically what you're going to hear or see as kind of that failure threshold. Okay. So failure increases the magnitude of volume from sets and reps, right? So as we're doing reps and reps across sets and sets, there's this accumulation of volume that's, that's occurring, right? And if you go to failure, and you guys have done this, if you go to failure on your first set, you just significantly increase the magnitude of that volume that you just did or completed, which can have adverse effects, not only in that workout, but in workouts to follow, okay? So doing more than what you can recover from here will start to work against you if abused session to session, all right? So the type of failure determines the magnitude of volume and it will, it, it will increase across whatever stimulus you're doing or whatever type of training you're doing. So in this case, uh, more hypertrophy-based training is kind of what I'm talking about. Um, and doing more than what you can recover from here will start to work against you if abused session to session, all right? So how we measure uh, degree of fatigue or degree of failure here typically is within RPE ratings or RIR, which is more like reps in reserve, um, which is probably the most common one that, that I would use, uh, which reps, reps in reserve, which it does, uh, it does correlate well with that RPE scale if you guys are more familiar with that one. Um, but these measurements have been found kind of be the best way of gauging proximity to failure and help us manage fatigue across a session. Okay. So how do we use these and how can we tell where we're at within a given set? All right. So hopefully I've made the point with introducing the kind of the byproducts of creating tension and sort of got you in the framework or the, the mind set of training to failure and accumulating more of those byproducts like metabolic stress and muscle damage than are otherwise needed each session is a negative thing. Okay, so I'm kind of answering that question of training to failure is not always the answer. And it honestly is, I'm going to go out and say is rarely the answer long term, right? That doesn't mean you never hit failure or you never you know, get close. Um, but what I'm suggesting is a good rule of thumb is to spend most of your training career utilizing somewhere between a four reps in reserve to a one reps in reserve, right? So you can sort of progress this over a phase, um, or you can have phases where you just, that are a little bit shorter, maybe in duration that you just go really, really hard to kind of push some adaptation or kind of push yourself a little bit. Um, but what it, it is a good rule of thumb to spend most of your training career utilizing somewhere between four and one reps in reserve. That kind of covers like four, three, two as well, right? Um, so there's a time and a place to push yourself to like zero reps in reserve or hitting true failure, um, you know, where you kind of end up fighting for partials at the end and stuff like that. Uh, but it, there's a time and a place, and I do think that outside of maybe having some fun some weeks, if you're looking for the most long-term progress, 
you should probably stay away from fighting for partials um, more than you don't, if that makes sense. Okay, so um, a couple like I, I actually saw this um, the other the other week, and I saved it. Um, and, a, and a good scale of kind of gauging reps in reserve here is uh, look taking a look at rep speed. Um, so if you're around kind of five reps in reserve, uh, your your reps are going to look similar to kind of your first, right? They're going to be faster. They're going to be more uniform. Um, we're not going to see much change in the speed of the rep. Three to four reps in reserve, the rep speed is going to get noticeably slower, okay? Two reps in reserve, for example, uh, you're going to have several slow reps, uh, but a couple more left in the tank, right? So two reps in reserve. One reps in reserve, it's going to be very slow, but that's going to be a confident rep. Without a doubt in your mind, you're going to get this rep. And I, I, it, I know I was training with Alex uh, in the past. It's I seemingly hop back and forth. And this is something you get better at throughout your career where you think you're kind of like one or two reps in reserve. And then all of a sudden you get like four or more um, and you feel stronger as you get through the set. I'm not sure where that comes in, uh, but there is a mental component here to these. Right. And that's, that's why I kind of want to point out um, that these are still very challenging reps. So being five reps in reserve, four reps in reserve, these are still very challenging, right? And the further along you get in your training age, the better and better you will start to get at gauging where you're at within this scale. Um, and I just wanna kind of wrap this up with, uh, and then we'll kind of create some discussion here, um, but spending more time within the four to one reps in reserve range allows for more steady progression across a phase, right? So. Training close to failure, I would say, is better than training to failure um, for the majority of your training career. Okay, so allowing yourself to grow and adapt at a pace that is realistic, not only for you, but for your physiology too. Some things I didn't touch on, which um, we can create some discourse on here, uh, is nutrition, sleep, and stress management. Um, but I really want to open the floor to, to, to these guys and see what I may have missed within this, uh, this discussion of uh, training to failure here. Yeah, uh, I think you touched on a lot of uh, great pieces. And, and I think that the, the main thing for the listeners to really take home is the um, kind of the build up to training to failure and having all the understanding of the components to for what you should look into uh, past listening to this. But I think that um, one thing that we drive home with with clients is that do we really know where we're at in terms of strength? Uh, because I know that many of the individuals that come to us, they've never actually, they, well, I shouldn't say never, but many have been in a situation where they've only trained by themselves or they've never really had someone push them to that limit of finding true failure in a safe environment. Uh, so I encourage you, if you've never really um, pinpointed specifically how strong you actually are, to uh, grab a couple couple friends and and take yourself to failure on on uh, different movements and filming that can be very helpful for you to to see where you're at uh, and then being able to truly articulate what your RIR or your RPE is going to be within those uh, movements. But um, yeah, I, I think that it's a great tool to be utilized sparingly. Uh, too many individuals feel as though that it has to be this just all or nothing mentality. And, and the reality is from a longevity perspective, it's going to be better to fall in that um, not maxing out every set <laughs> rep range. <laughs> Um, I'm sure we'll do an episode on this, just talking about the different training stimulus and probably even diving deeper into this specific situation as far as training to failure. But something that I did want to point out and Austin had talked about is just stress management and nutrition and what that looks like together. And so we've already done um, a segment on sleep. So I'd highly encourage you to go back and listen to that. But it's something that sleep and stress are two things that go wildly unchecked when it comes to someone's fitness routine. They just 
kind of look at, okay, I'm training and I'm doing the nutrition side, but that stress and sleep can completely derail someone's progress. And if you're training to failure every single day, every single rep, every single session, every single set, that is going to accumulate a lot of stress on your body. And I know for some of you listening, you might be like, oh, the gym is my time to de-stress. It's my time. And while that might be true, and it's definitely been true for all three of us, um, just having that time and it being a de-stressor in a sense or something that's going to help us throughout the day, it's also something that is a stress on your body. And so training and then stressing your body further by training to failure for everything and not properly making sure that your stress or your sleep or your nutrition is in that spot, that can put you in a very dangerous spot, um, especially hormone related, where if you push yourself that long for that amount of time without taking care of yourself, you can end up... um, I have slipped down the slippery slope and now you're at the bottom of that slope. Uh, so it's something to really keep into my, keep in mind here. Um, and within training, we're also going to be doing one on peri-workout nutrition here in a couple of weeks um, and talking about how you can really utilize nutrition to make sure that your training is top notch. But as both of them touched on here, when it comes to training, there's a time and place for failure. Um, and oftentimes it comes to a place of when we don't have failure in every session, clients are like, well, that was... That was weird not pushing myself to absolute failure or why am I not trying to progressively overload because you've heard a million times that progressive overload is how you see results but within each training stimulus there is a goal to be accomplished there and not every time is it to increase weight that you're putting on the bar or that you're picking up and so being able to realize that there is going to be a theme to different training phases and different training stimuli uh, and being able to follow that instead of being like oh man I'm a weak little bitch because I didn't put more weight on the bar. It's like, no, I was being smart because I want to be progressive. If you think about powerlifting, they're they're lifting some heavy freaking loads. And if you look at their training, they're not training their one rep max every single time they train, they would not progress. And so it's being able to look at it in that realm. And for some, some reason, that's like easier for me to conceptualize is the fact of like, you need to be progressive in different ways to be able to hit those higher numbers. It's not just every time I go in the gym, I have to pick up a higher weight or I'm not progressing. So that would be my two cents on it more than anything is just being able to look at that full picture of why you think you need to train to failure. And that's what we want this podcast to be, not only for you guys to learn a ton from, but also to stop and ask yourself questions and reflect on your own journey as to why you're doing something and why it's in place. This is a technique I use for a lot of my clients. When they come to me, they might be like, oh, I'm doing this much cardio. I'm doing this within training. I'm doing this. And I say, okay, why are you doing those things? I'd love to know your reasoning on why. And they're like, oh, I don't really know. I guess I started a while ago and I'm still doing it. So being able to reflect back on why you're doing certain things, why you feel like you need to train to failure, why you feel like you need to do whatever it may be and addressing that and learning about that, diving deep into it and then applying that to your life. Well, yeah, great points by you both. And the last thing I want to mention before we we hop into to Sue's segment here about tempo is it's not why I wanted to kind of approach it in that way. Um, And we will have a full episode, I'm sure, about diving into the details of that, where we'll spend, you know, a long duration, probably the whole podcast talking about this subject. I just wanted to sort of open your mind up to the byproducts and underpinnings of sort of the, the consequence of tension created within our body, right? And it's not that you memorize every detail I just said, right? Because This information is out there and please let us know if you want to learn more about it. But what you need to understand from this is that by creating tension, by going into the gym and lifting loads, um, there is a consequence to that from a physiological perspective. And it's not that those consequences are by nature negative, but if too much of something is occurring, right, everything in it's kind of the dosage is the poison right and so a little bit of accumulation of metabolic stress can be a good thing because it it does force adaptation and a little bit of muscle damage can tell us some really good things about our our training session potentially like okay we direct attention really well and and sort of targeted these muscles really well um and therefore 
you know, we created a, a high magnitude of, of stress and volume within these muscle groups. I'm a little sore. Like, okay, that can be telling. That can be a good thing. But too much. And the dosage is the poison. And I basically wanted just to introduce to you some of those underpinnings and consequences um, and byproducts of creating tension from a physiological perspective. Okay, so one of those things, um, and Sue kind of ended her um, her answer with this, was putting weight on the bar is not the only way to progress within a training session or a training phase. And one way of progressing, depending on kind of the goal of that phase, is going to be repetition tempo, right? And manipulating tempo throughout a phase or getting improving tempo across a session or across a phase is absolutely progressive overload, um, especially relative to the goal that we may be trying to go for. So Sue, uh, how can we better understand repetition tempo? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that, but <laughs> going into tempo here. So tempo is going to be one of the most overlooked components of any program design. It's something I see time and time again. Um, it's also one of the most important variables in determining the stimulus of your training program. So reps and sets can be meaningless if you don't control what the reps are doing. So tempo in and of itself is going to be the amount of tension and the length of tension. So the wrong tempo for the wrong exercise or training goal, like I said, can make it worthless or meaningless. So it's something that um, when you're determining the stimulus of your training program, looking back at tempo can be very helpful. Um, and some can even argue that tempo is just as important as the load that you choose uh, because it is, like I said, telling you what you're doing within that rep. So um, tempo and reps combined are what determines what load you can or should be using. Um, and if you're not controlling that tempo, you can throw out the concept of progressive overload for a certain stimulus um, and any sort of progression because you're not controlling the effect of each rep. And that's what you want to think about. What effect am I getting from each rep? And also, how do I want to stress my body throughout this stimulus? So tempo not only determines how much time under tension there is in a rep, it's determined by the amount of time you spend in the four phases of each rep. So those four phases are going to be the eccentric, lengthened, concentric, and shortened. So each of these phases have different metabolic and mechanical effects on the muscle, and you can create more or less mechanical damage or create more or less metabolic stress simply by altering the tempo. And it also allows you to really capitalize on resistance profiles of different exercises. So some might have a greater resistance in the lengthened or shortened, and so controlling that tempo allows you to emphasize these portions of the exercise and get more out of each rep. It's also something that if you maybe are using a machine that doesn't work the absolute best, we've all been on like a janky leg extension or leg curl or whatever it may be, you can utilize tempo to kind of make up for that to a certain degree and being able to have that in place. And then you can also utilize tempo for momentum, which momentum isn't always viewed as a negative. We do have a YouTube video on that talking about how momentum can be beneficial and how tempo kind of plays into that. Um, but a program, it's very hard for it to have a clear goal without tempo because it opens up the execution of the program to a ton of different variables here. So being able to look at what the tempo is doing and what it's setting you up and that effect of each rep is going to be pretty important here. And I'm sure you've seen plenty of people going into the gym and just jerking around weight or just trying to get weight from point A to point B. And that's not always our goal. It's not just to move through space. It's being able to have the effect of that rep to have the most benefit on the musculature we're working because we also don't want to waste time in the gym. No one's, no one's got time for that. We want to be efficient within our use of that. So within, um, the tempos, some lifting tempos, um, written in your program. Some common ones you might see are 3011, 4010, 3110. So um, if you're looking at one like the 3110 um, and what that breaks down into, the first number is always going to be the eccentric. It's not just the start of the movement. It's going to be the eccentric. And this is where some people get tripped up when an exercise doesn't start with an eccentric. And so I'll talk about that in a little bit. But if we're looking at this, um, going through it, three is going to be the time time spent in the eccentric. One is going to be the time pausing after the eccentric in the lengthened position. One, um, again, is going to be the time in the concentric. And then zero is the time at the end of the concentric um, that's in the shortened position of the muscle. So diving into the four phases of that and kind of what each of those means. So the eccentric, like I said, it's always going to be the first 
first number that's going to be there. And most of the time, it is going to be the highest number. And it's something that as you're thinking about the eccentric and controlling that weight down, um, you really want to think about the eccentric is when the muscle that we're trying to train is lengthening. So if you're thinking about lowering the dumbbells in a curl or um, doing a lat pull down, and as you're raising your arms back up, that's going to be the lengthening portion that you're getting to. That's going to be the eccentric. Now, one thing to remember here is it's not always the lowering of the weight or the start of the exercise, like I mentioned earlier, it is the lengthening of the muscle. So we'll go through a few examples of exercises that might be a little bit confusing diving into this. As far as the lengthened position, that second number, um, it's the pause after the eccentric. So it's a great way to reduce momentum and maintain tension in the muscle being trained. So at the bottom of a squat, um, there's still tension and it's a good place for a pause to be programmed. Um, so they can be written as multiple different numbers. In this example, it is a one second pause and then being being able to move through it. The concentric is that third number and it's the time spent in the concentric. And this is the actual contraction of the muscle and movement of the load. And then the shortened position, the fourth number um, is going to be the time spent in the peak of contraction. So um, that's something that can be an isometric there. Um, and you're not just holding the weight there. You're consciously squeezing the muscle as hard as possible or engaging the muscle um, and being able to have that. So it's not just a relaxed version. So you also want to take into account like what the resistance profile of is of an exercise when writing that tempo. So if you're doing a barbell back squat, the top of the exercise when you're standing there with a the bar, yes, it's taxing you because you have weight on your back and it's heavy, but you're not necessarily engaged um, or like squeezing in, um the muscles groups that you're working. Of course, your core is engaged and you're standing in a good position, but at the top isn't where you're being worked because your joints are stacked. There's not as much tension in the muscle. So it's not something where you would have a super long pause there because you're just standing there with weight on your back. So kind of thinking about that. Um, and so with tempo, it matters for creating, keeping tension and the amount of tension given at a portion of a movement. And tempo is not just how long we want to stay in different phases. It's also about the momentum we have um, and what we want to create there. So thinking about the deceleration and acceleration of that movement. Um, and so with that, the faster the concentric, the more acceleration and more momentum you will generate. And the faster the eccentric, the more momentum you'll have to overcome and decelerate to stop the load. So a few examples of this when it comes to acceleration as if um, and why tempo can matter in that regard. Let's say you're doing a lying leg curl. The first 10 to 15 degrees are mostly going to be using your calf muscles. And so you sometimes see people who have great calves and not a lot of hamstrings. And that can be because they are going through a lot of hamstring movements incorrectly. And that's great that you are able to get calves because some of us struggle with peg leg syndrome. Uh, but it is something where now you do not have the hamstrings that you want and they're not engaged in movement. So um, the first 10 to 15 degrees of that lying leg curl, you're getting a lot of calf engagement. If you accelerate far too much through that movement, your calves take over the whole exercise and your hamstrings don't really get into it. So that's something that you're going to want to not have acceleration as you go through that movement. Another example here is the leg extension. If you're using too much acceleration out of the bottom, you're not actually getting what you need to out of that movement. Um, you get to the top, you start bouncing, and then you're just moving moving through. And so we don't want to, again, just move through space. We want to have a purpose for what we're doing here. So with tempo, um, the tempo or momentum can alter the resistance profile of an exercise. Um, and that's like what I just said, it can completely alter what you are working with in that exercise. Um, so it's something you want to keep in mind. So when it comes to tempo, um, it can be a sufficient enough variable to change an exercise um, because of the impact of the resistance profile. And it can be a sufficient enough variable to change the motor recruitment pattern up uh, motor recruitment pattern of an exercise. So another example, which is the one we talk about in the YouTube video, is going over the dumbbell lateral raise, um, where momentum can be very beneficial and being able to have a different tempo there allows us to hit that different resistance profile. So if you're going slow in a dumbbell lateral raise, and it's going to be uh, really heavy at the top, you are going to be working um, in that shortened range. And then if you change the tempo so that you're doing it a little bit faster, um, then it'll end up 
feeling light at the top and heavy at the bottom, and you're getting more of that lengthened portion of the um, medial delt. So being able to utilize tempo allows you to change around some resistance profiles and hit in different places. Or like I said, if you have like a janky leg curl um, and you are doing um, a seated leg curl on it, maybe doing one and one fourth reps or changing the tempo on that could be extremely beneficial to work around the fact that it is a piece of crap machinery. <laughs> um, so you can play around with that um, a little bit there. So um, you can utilize tempo for a lot of different things here. Um, and like I talked about within faster tempos and what that causes and the end result um, and some slower tempos and what that causes. What I will say, and this is a generalization here, if you are a beginner, always start with some slower tempos here. People are normally moving through movements way too quickly. And so going slower is going to really make sure you're getting the effect of the rep that you want, because most of the time going slower is going to be hitting the um, resistance profile that is supposed to be hit through that exercise and changing the tempo or going faster can make it hit something that isn't necessarily what you originally intended. So you want to think about your intent here um, and going through those movements. So how I'll talk about um, some uh, the last few things I'll talk about before I summarize it and then give it over to these guys because you could dive into tempo and go through like the specifics and that could be its own uh, episode as well about how to change everything for a certain example. Um, but for something like a squat, it starts with the eccentric. So it's very easy to look at tempo if it's three Three one one zero. The three is lowering down into the seat, sitting position of the squat. The one is having one pause at the bottom of the squat. One is coming up from the squat and then zero seconds at the top and going back into it. Where it gets a little bit tricky is movements that don't start with an eccentric. So let's take a lat pull down, for example, where it's starting with the concentric as you pull the weight down. So with that, what you would want to do here is either think about the numbers in a different order, or you can kind of start counting after you've started the first rep. So let's say you like get the weight and you pull it down and you're in the concentric, then you can start from the eccentric and it would be three seconds as you raise your arms up to the top, one second at the top, one second pulling back down and zero seconds at the bottom. So um, being able to summarize a few things here is that um, tempo is going to be four characters. Um, the first number is always going to be um, the eccentric. It's not just going to be when the exercise starts. The eccentric is the length lengthening of the muscle and the concentric is the shortening of a muscle as it contracts. Um, and then another thing within tempo training is it can help develop body control. It can help increase connective tissue strength, um, and that can aid in hypertrophy. It can improve body awareness. It can improve control of lifts, improve stability, and focus on the muddle, mus muddle, <laughs> and focus on the muscle instead of the tendons. So that would be my main advice when it comes to tempos and being able, uh, able to understand those four numbers and where they come into play and how you should utilize them. Um, but I'll hand it off over to these two to kind of dive into anything that I missed or dive deeper into anything. We got Alex. I think you're next. So the, the few things that I will add is as Sue did a great job of explaining and going over tempo is that things that we see within clients who have not utilized tempo uh, within their training before is that they have kind of a paralysis by analysis situation where they certainly overthink and want to be, you know, perfect within the the tempo allocations that we put into place. Oftentimes, when we are starting with clients, it's more of teaching better control within the movements, control and execution being our, our biggest two um, points of emphasis within utilizing tempo in their training. And so going into the set, having an understanding of what the tempo is um, and not being in the set and trying to count specific seconds to to ensure that it's perfect is going to be the best way to apply it. So having an idea of like, okay, this is kind of a rough idea of where three seconds is at. This is where two seconds is within this portion of the movement and then taking video and being like, okay, that was kind of fast. I should slow that down. Or I was like, oh, I'm really slow. I need to speed this up a little bit because that's oftentimes um, a possibility. And the other thing that I will touch on is that the first time people implement tempo training is that they feel as though it's this excessively less amount of, of weight that they've used for that rep range previously. And the reality is, is that it may be less, but it's not substantially. It's going to be, um, you know, a, a 
10% or something less than what you would maybe generally use for that rep range, provided that you had good execution prior to that. But it's not going to be like 50% of what you use previously. And then you're just kind of like, I don't really feel anything. I'm just moving this weight through space type situation. So still challenge yourself with the load that's being selected. It's not a matter of like, well, tempo training is for light training and not tempo training is for heavy training. It's it's a combination of the two. Both have to be present for you to really see the, the strides in your physique that you want to see. And if you do got to drop to 50%, then maybe you really need a tempo in place because you're just swinging weights around with your whole body there. Yeah, I want to build on uh, great points by you both. And I want to build upon uh, what Alex finished up with, which is basically um, creating control. And control is going to be positive no matter the goal. And apparently that hip hop artist over here. (laughs) So... The ability to create significant tension is going to be a key variable no matter the training stimulus, right? So no matter if your goal is hypertrophy, no matter if your goal is strength, no matter if your goal is overall just, you know, body comp, sort of metabolic driven training or whatever it is, no matter the goal, creating significant amounts of tension in the muscle that we're trying to create it in is going to be a key variable, right? So um, we need a certain amount of tension in a muscle over a certain amount with a certain amount of volume to create or sort of stimulate an adaptation, right? And so if your goal is to build muscle and let's say, this is probably one of the the biggest factors in sort of weak point training I think people miss um, is let's say you have uh, oh, it's peg leg syndrome, whatever, um, <laughs> you know, One, you may not just be like, so if you have smaller calves, one, you're probably not training them often enough. Um, But oftentimes for like calf training, your tempo's disadvantageous to your goal, right? So there's a lot, especially like the Achilles heel, (laughs) the Achilles heel of your uh, calf training comes to the Achilles tendon of um, sort of your your limiting factors, your Achilles tendon within a calf training is, is what I'm trying to say, because the Achilles tendon uh, holds a lot of elastic energy, which if your tempo isn't intentional and you don't, let's say in the eccentric, you don't have a a long enough control on your eccentric and you just kind of allow yourself to to shoot down after, let's say, a standing calf raise, you just allow yourself to drop to the bottom and just sort of use that elastic energy to keep bouncing up and down, bouncing up and down. We see this all the time. How much tension do you think your calf is getting? Maybe some, absolutely, because we the, we need some something to happen in the muscle, but not as nearly as much as it could, right? And the more tension we can create in that muscle, the more control we can have, and the more volume we can accumulate of that tension in that muscle, the more of a chance we give ourselves to grow and respond and have to adapt to that over time, right? And the other thing that I wanted to mention within uh, tempo, especially when starting out, it's more neurologically demanding to think about something during a rep than it is to not, right? So we have to consider that as well, right? So if you've gone from, well, I don't even think about it, I just move loads and move weight. One, there's some things happening from a muscular perspective that your your muscles are now having to take on more load. So you may not be as strong. Those muscles not may not be as strong as you once thought or um, be able to sort of withstand th- that amount of uh, significant amount of tension or, or load. But also you have to consider your brain only has, right? We only have so much resource allocation. And if your brain's not used to having to consider and think about these things before and now it is that is more neurologically demanding and by default that's going to make you slightly let's say weaker in the short term right but as you adapt as your as your nervous system adapts as you gain more control and do get stronger that is going to index you past your plateaus and and we've all seen this right um, if you've been someone who's 
especially a client of ours who you're going to be feeling better. Your joints are going to feel better. Your muscles are going to respond better. You're probably going to get stronger. Um, you're going to do more with the volume you're doing. Um, meaning you don't need excessive amounts of volume, uh, in your training phase because you're actually using and targeting the tissues and put placing tension on the tissues you're meaning to. Um, and again, this kind of goes with weak point training, like in your chest, like with your chest, for example, um, if you're not great at creating tension in your chest, we may need 20 plus sets per week because you just are trying to hit, get something there. Right. And if we're able to be very intentional and our execution's good and our tempo is good and we're controlling where tension's going, we're creating significant amounts of tension over the weeks. Um, you're going to see that volume number start to go down, right? And you're going to do more with less. And that is the goal long-term, right? Because that's going to help us reduce risk of injury. It's going to reduce the amount of wear and tear we have on our connective tissues, the amount of overall stress our physiology is having to deal with, right? So going back to kind of what I introduced in those, the sort of the byproducts of creating tension is going to be metabolic stress and, and muscle damage, right? And we only, if all stress is, sort of calculated equally in our body, we want to maximize the amount of training stress to positive adaptation that we can. And if we're just moving a lot of load, we're just doing a lot of stuff, that's going to limit us long-term, if that makes sense. Um, so I'll just leave it there, but all of those factors are, are very crucial. And no matter your goal, building strength, building muscle, losing body fat, whatever it is, it's going to get easier. It's going to improve. You're going to be able to do more with less as you improve your execution, as you improve your ability to create tension, which does come down to control and controlling that rep tempo. Awesome. Nailed it. Uh, well, with that, we with the world starting to open up again, some travel being able to be in place. Alex, what are some things to keep in mind with uh, traveling and training and keeping on track? Absolutely. Um, so with this question, more so um, with with the holidays coming up, we just had the, the Canadian Thanksgiving transpire to all the Canadian listeners. Happy late Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, now, this is something that uh, within your your travels and things of that nature, um, you're going to want to still be able to train. But of course, the likelihood that you're going to have the, the same abundance of time or within your routine, having the time to allocate towards longer training sessions and, and sticking to the regimen is not uh, all that likely, potentially, when you're going to see your family and, and wanting to prioritize time with them. We want to have an approach that is still going to keep you in alignment with your goals of, of maintaining quality body composition, um, but also making the most out of your time there where you may be training five days while you are at home in your normal routine. And you may only have three or four days or maybe even just two days um, to be able to train while you are uh, out and about and spending time with your family. So if let's kind of look at these things uh, singularly so that we have some examples to to pull from. Um, and, and I may want to say prior of, of what we want to elicit during in these training sessions and being the most efficient that we can. So let's say that we only have uh, two training sessions. Maybe we hit two full body sessions. Even if we have three, I would still recommend having more of a full body approach when we're selecting exercises and things of that nature. If we have four sessions, if we have the luxury of that, then we would uh, advise doing something that is more lower uh, upper, lower, or anterior and posterior. So the the front side of your body and the back side of your body um, being split apart, but with this, the, the goal here is to get the most bang for our buck and something that we utilize within our clients is going to be more metabolically based training. And the reason for this is that this is going to help with, um, glucose use. So expending a lot of, um, muscle glycogen, it's going to improve insulin sensitivity. So your ability to maybe have some extra food during the holidays in that time frame and, and better utilization and storage of that food. Um, so with the metabolic training, we're going to be having shorter rest periods, which is going to be beneficial to you and your, um, uh, 
small amount of time to be able to train. And then uh, what I would, what we would recommend is that um, you can either utilize supersets that are going to be training the same muscle tissue. You could do supersets that are going to be training um, antagonist tissue, uh, whatever is going to be best for you. But supersets, whether you utilize that or you do things that are more straight sets for more sets would be the most beneficial to you um, in terms of creating the most efficient programming. And this is going to be different in terms of if you're able to find a gym around where you're traveling, which is going to be great. Uh, maybe you're having to use a hotel gym, which obviously brings down the um, diversity that you're able to utilize within the uh, exercises that you're selecting, but that's still okay. But being creative, understanding that you're going to have to get outside of your normal programming and being okay with that is very important in maximizing your overall activity uh, outside of resistance training. Because again, maybe you're not even able to get in the gym. Maybe you're going to have to focus on maybe yoga sessions in the morning, doing some outdoor walks with your family, getting them active as well can be beneficial for you. Uh, and so in these times of travel, being very, very creative uh, within the exercise selection, utilizing supersets, utilizing shorter rest periods, understanding that this is going to be a time of submaximal loading. The likelihood that your apartment gym has, our hotel gym has 100 pound dumbbells or something of that nature to truly elicit the same response that you would see within your, maybe your programmed uh, training is just probably not likely, uh, nor are you probably going to have maybe the same calories in place, the same sleep schedule, all these different things. So it's going, going to be better to treat this time as more of a, a deload with the submaximal training, more metabolically stimulating uh, training type and, and going from there. And to add on to that, um, <laughs> well put. And I think uh, a couple of things that I want to mention here, one, I'll kind of tack on to the end of what uh, what you said about loads and the availability to loads and your ability to train like you did at home. And I think managing expectations on the road is one of the best things you can possibly do. Um, this doesn't mean you can't train hard. This doesn't mean you can't have challenging sessions. This doesn't mean that all your progress is out the window. But what this does mean is things change. Right. So if you've gone from I'll, I'll put this in context or kind of compare it to something else that we we're all familiar with, at least during this last eight months or so. If let's say you worked in an office and now you had to work from home, that's a different experience. Right. If you have worked from home all your life and then take your work on the road, that's an altogether different experience. Right? You're changing the environment, you're changing the experience of what you're doing, and this goes for training as well. Right, So don't expect yourself, and I think managing expectations is crucial here, don't expect yourself to be everything that you've been at your normal gym and your normal training experience or environment while on the road. Again, I'll, I'll repeat, like this doesn't mean you shouldn't challenge yourself, this doesn't mean you can't have hard training sessions. But I think managing those expectations are, are crucial, okay? And if you have or are kind of in a position where you don't have as much load, again, this goes back to, to manipulating tempo. This goes back to um, doing what we can to create tension. Um, but this goes back to tempo and resistance profiles, right? So spending more time where the rep was most challenging or hardest, right? So let's say you have access to, um, you know, maybe uh, some lighter dumbbells, right? You can manipulate tempo um, in, a, in the place of the rep, so like in a bench press. Maybe you lengthen the pause at the bottom of that bench press because, you know, you usually bench press with hundreds and there's only 50s, right? So maybe you increase the reps and maybe change the tempo, um, something of the sort, right? And if you have a coach, like I'm sure they'll, they'll, configure this for you a bit more. But if you don't, these are some things that you can manipulate, right? So tempo can help us increase the resistance of lighter loads, right? So this is where we kind of get into quarter reps and um, things like that, or one and a quarter reps, right? So on like a leg extension, um, this is a great, if you don't have access to much load, um, or the, the leg extension doesn't, maybe it's not challenging enough or, or whatever, 
um, or maybe you just have bands. Let's use this example. You just have bands, right? And the, that band resistance while doing normal reps, it's just, you would have to do 30 reps to feel fatigued. If you add in sort of a, a one and a quarter, meaning you do one full rep, you go a quarter of the way up and you go right back down into the hardest portion of that rep, let's say with like a banded pull down, and you also utilize tempo here where you're spending more time in that position where it's most challenging, that's going to impact the amount of reps you're having to do, right? So instead of 30, maybe we can get away with 15, right? And that's gonna be a much more efficient way of training. It's gonna be less monotonous, a lot less boring. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but I can't stand to do 30 reps of anything, uh, regardless of what it is. Um, and I, I just wanna make one last note here uh, that training to failure, um, I'll continue on with my training to failure talk. Training to failure isn't going to be necessarily better here. Um, training hard is worth your while, but pushing to or beyond failure can work against some of those nutrient uh, partitioning effects that Alex mentioned, right? So your ability to, to uptake glucose, your, your ability to um, kind of efficiently partition nutrients and being able to like have somewhere for that food to go. If you push to or beyond failure, right? So those, those underpinnings I talked about, right? That, that metabolic stress, creating a, a systemic inflammatory response, same thing with muscle damage, too much of these things, right, can work against us, um, especially in this scenario, right? So train hard, challenge yourself, but don't think more is better here and don't think that training to failure is the answer um, because training to failure in this situation can actually start to work against you um, in, the, in the, not only in the short term, but in the long term as well. So um, especially for that goal of kind of reaping the rewards of trying to get a good workout in before you eat a larger meal, right? So, um, Sue, what do you got? Yeah, you guys basically hit on everything. You covered it. Um, I was just going to touch on um, finding a gym and what that looks like for travel. So what we do, um, Alex and I, and I know Austin does this too, does as well, does this too, um, travel a, a good chunk. Obviously, Corona put a little bit damper on that, but um, we still traveled for about two weeks in a row, and then we're about to travel for another two and a half weeks. And it can get really frustrating and daunting when it's like, well, what do I do for the gym in those situations? Because for us, we're going to be bouncing around. We're going to go from Columbus to Florida to Texas to Carolina, South Carolina, back to Ohio, that's really hard to navigate around. Um, so one of the best tips I can give you is before you go on your trip is to be able to look for a gym, call them, find out about day passes and get that all sorted out. So you already have a game plan when you get there. Oftentimes people get to their place, then they look for a gym and then it becomes the last priority. And then it's multiple days without the gym, which is completely fine to have days without the gym. I do not want to demonize that whatsoever. But if you plan to stay and be in the gym, and you wanted to be in the gym, that can be quite a, a road bump to overcome. So also taking into effect, are you going to need to take Ubers to the gym? Um, or will you have a car that you can drive to the gym, especially with visiting family and what that looks like? Um, so we always know before we get there, probably the gym we will go to. Sometimes it does change, but we normally have a game plan for what gym we're going to. We've already called, found out about day passes and staffed hours. So there's a gym that we go to whenever we visit Alex's family and it has staffed hours. And, and otherwise you have to have a key card. So I have to be very aware of when I'm trying to get my workouts in so I don't completely screw myself over and being able to have that in place. Um, and then being able to make sure you're getting the best deal. If you're going to be there for three days, maybe the week pass might be a better financial deal than just paying each day pass for three days. So figuring that out will alleviate a lot of stress. And another tip there is if you are going to a gym you've never been to and you're trying to figure out the lay of the land, making sure you take a lap around the gym before you start or warm up on the treadmill. Oftentimes the treadmills or cardio equipment overlook the gym and you can get a good look of what it has and what you need to change within your training. And again, having that plan in place beforehand, because it can go downhill very quickly if you do not. Um, another thing that Alex mentioned that I want to re-mention is just thinking about movement in general. When I visit my family um, and recently, because I've had fasted cardio in the morning and then training later in the day and maybe some more cardio as I transition out of prep or even when I was visiting in prep, it's something that I don't want to take that much time away from my family. So trying to find 
ways around that. My mom loves to go for walks. So we would go for a walk every morning together. And that was a great way to still get in my movement, still get in my cardio, but really spend time with my mom. Um, so it was absolutely fantastic to do that. And there's plenty of free YouTube videos for yoga, like Alex had mentioned, but being able to just look up yoga or a dance video or something to be able to get moving if you can't go to a gym or you don't want to take that time away from your family. Um, the other thing that I will say is structuring your training um, around travel. Alex had briefly mentioned just kind of going into a deload or making it transition into metabolic training. And that's something that for Alex does my training, if anyone didn't know, and we're about to go into that travel. And I was like, I'm feeling a little bit burnt out, but it's not to the point that I would want to push until we travel and then take a deload. I think I would feel better if we took like a mini deload, than being able to have some training in place and then go into more metabolic training because we are going to be short on equipment and be running around and all these different things. And those sessions are normally shorter. So being able to structure that in advance, if you do know you are traveling in advance is always extremely helpful or making it a plan deload like we talked about in the deload episode um, of just not training or just getting in different forms of movement, which can be extremely beneficial. And it might be what you need because you're out of routine. You're not in your normal sleep schedule. Things might be less than advantageous and making sure that you're putting yourself in a place that it's the absolute best that you are going to be um, honoring your digestion, your stress, your nutrients, everything like that is going to be extremely, extremely beneficial. Um, and so the last thing I'll say about just training and traveling is even taking some of the notes from the home training um, episode into consideration and re recognizing, like Austin said, it's not going to be the same experience and you don't need to mimic that and it doesn't need to be perfect. It needs to be something. Um, something is always better than nothing. So being able to look at that and be like, okay, maybe I can't test my one rep max deadlifting while I'm traveling at this hotel gym, but maybe I can still move my body and be in a good spot and not expect that from myself. Um, cause that'll be a lot better than going in and expecting this perfect situation, which rarely ever happens. So that would be my last few, few notes on traveling and training. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to reiterate again, um, or kind of echo what, what Sue mentioned there and, um, one, for example, like I, I just recently was in Denver for quite a, I mean, six full days, seven full days or something. And, you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of time sort of away from my normal gym. That's, and I'm, I'm in a place where I'm, I'm really motivated to train. I'm, I'm really wanting to kind of get myself back to, to some places I, I've been in the past physically. And, um, you know, that was one of those things where I, I wanted to do every part of the, the Colorado trip. Um, but I was little down on, I, I had to leave my, the gym I was, I have been going to because I've been having such great workouts. Um, but one thing that I did to sort of work around that was I knew that I wasn't going to be near no matter where I stayed. Um, just with the way that sort of Colorado gyms are laid out, especially during this time during COVID, uh, restriction, I knew I wasn't gonna be able to kind of get to a gym outside of my hotel. So I was just really sure to do some research and in, into what each hotel had to offer from a gym perspective. And I chose the hotel um, that seemed to have great, the best price, but also aligned with uh, having a, a good gym setup. You know, they had a functional trainer, they had some dumbbells that were heavier. Um, you know, they had things that allowed me to still train hard and, and have challenging workouts um, that didn't that didn't put me off. And the, the last thing I wanted to also echo was if you guys are unsure that how to set those training sessions up, uh, I did kind of go over that in, in some detail in episode one, um, where I talk about creating at home training programs. Uh, so if you need, those are still very re um, relevant to uh, traveling and training as well. Like if you don't have a coach that, that can do that for you, um, that episode can be insightful to to setting that up anything else you had alex no cool. everything's good i thought this was a really good episode awesome yeah awesome 